What's up, guys? So Dylan and I have sat down to record what we were going to make a podcast like, what, four times now? Th three or four times we have sat down to do this, and we've never done anything with the file. So today we're going to change that. We are going to record for a little while, and we're going to release it as a sort of beta episode, and we're going to get your feedback. And if you like this, we can do it more. If you hate it, then well, just don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, if, if y'all want to hear us talking about our ideas on SEO websites, um, you know, web technology, whatever, uh, we are we're up for doing that. We're interested in doing that. But uh, today we're gonna we're gonna try something. Uh, we've been asking questions to get into the Facebook group, the Feel Your Photos group, and the SEO for Photographers group. And it's basically what is the most, uh, what is your number one question about SEO right now or something like that. We're going to go down the list and we're just going to basically ask each other these questions for a little while and record that and see where it goes. So Dylan, you want to pick the first question? Sure, totally. Uh, it looks like the first question is, how repetitive should I be without hurting my SEO in the process? So do you want to you want to read the question and yeah. I'll answer it and I'll read a question and you answer it something like that or yeah. we can obviously just kind of riff on it after that. Totally. That sounds great. Cool. Well, I'll I'll answer that first question then. How repetitive should you be? Well, this kind of depends on kind of where you're coming at this question from because if you're talking about topics in general, you don't want to be repetitive at all. You want to cover a topic that has the same intent only once. So if someone goes to Google and they search for a phrase that represents a specific intent, they want to do a specific thing, then there should be one page on your website that lets them do that thing, that answers that question for them, that serves that specific intent. If there are more than one page on your website that are conflicting, where they may uh, all potentially serve that event to that that intent to some extent, that's hard to say, uh, then Google's gonna potentially be confused about which one to show. Or it's hard to say confused, they're, they're gonna have to decide which one to show and it may not be the one that you want them to show. Um, it, it, it happens all the time where we see people have multiple pages that cover the same topic and the one that they would hope to rank for that topic is not the one that's ranking at all. It's some other random page on the site. So as far as topics go, you don't want to be repetitive at all. Now, when it comes to topics that potentially have multiple intents, this line gets a little fuzzy. I don't want to go into like really specific examples right now, but the idea is sometimes someone could want something a little bit different. Let me just try to come up with one example. Let's say I am searching for uh, something about a wedding photography contract. Well, that's a topic where I could be saying what I want is to download a sample contract. So if I had a page on my site that had PDF download, free download, words like this with actual downloads on the page, Google would probably serve it for that type of intent when they, when they assume that someone wants to download that uh, contract. But maybe I'm a client who is curious about what's typically included or have questions about a contract. Uh, and so if my article were something like uh, most common items on wedding photography contract, that serves a completely different intent than downloading a sample contract. So that was just a random example off the top of my head, but realize that you could cover a broad topic like wedding photography or photography contracts with multiple pages on your site as long as the intent is different you have anything else to add to that maybe dylan why don't yeah. you other other than that like being repetitive maybe talk a little bit about on a single page with a particular phrase or keyword exactly that's that's kind of what i was thinking while you're talking is the other situation for repetition in seo is often what used to be like really referred to as keyword density or how many times you repeat a certain phrase on a page and for a long time, people were always talking about like how like increasing keyword density would improve rankings. And then it became in vogue to look at decreasing that keyword density to make sure that you're not hurt algorithmically uh, with your rankings. And I, I do think it's something to think about in some situations. If you, if you think that a page really isn't ranking where it should be, then it's time to start looking at competitors and see how many times they're possibly repeating similar phrases. Uh, but, By the way, don't look at one competitor. Look at a what we call the corpus, the yeah. body of work that's ranking. Look at the top 10 or 20 results and see how 
often on average people are using a particular keyword or phrase. Exactly. And, and really pay attention to sites that are similar to yours, not uh, big directories that might be ranking because of their authority in the space, but even though they have massive on-page issues. Um, and so it is some, sometimes something to think about. I think in general, people need to write naturally, write for the user. And in doing so, you generally say the topics and phrases that are required to rank an, an, a normal amount of times or a, a, a decent amount. Um, there's very, I can think of situations where it's been helpful in the past to actually look at those numbers and, and increase those keyword densities or decrease. Uh, but almost all the time, I, I just want people to, to write for the actual intent behind the query that Corey was talking about. Yeah, so a good thing to, a good rule of thumb might be if you can read it out loud and it sounds normal, if you would read it to a person who asked you the question directly off your page, it's probably to totally fine. Um, that being said, it, there are plenty of cases we've seen where if you want to rank for a very specific query, let's say that you did some keyword research. Again, careful with this because uh, tools can be misleading. There's a whole weird situation going on with volume with keyword tools that we've been talking about behind the scenes. Not going to get into that today, but the idea is let's just say you've, you're pretty sure. Maybe you looked in Search Console and you found that a specific way that people type a query gets 10 times more search volume than any other variation, and you really want to target that specific uh, phrasing of the term, including that exact phrasing in places like your title or the H1 or... Um, maybe using that exact phrasing at least a few times on your page can be very important in some cases. It's not always important. So this is a really hard question to answer because it's very dependent on everything else that's currently ranking and how Google's determining relevance and how much they know about the topic and things like that. Um, so anyway, the point is like if you, if you want a rule of thumb, read it out loud, see if it sounds normal to something you would say to someone else. And, and then outside of that, I would say on a typical page that's, you know, let's say a thousand words, if you're trying to rank for a very specific query that's like a two to three, maybe four word phrase, you probably want to use that somewhere between four to 10 times. It's like, I'm just making that up. Don't take that as like, yeah. this is the exact keyword density that you need to use. But on average, that's kind of what I typically see. Yeah. And one like super advanced tip, there are tools like uh, keyword or SEO Surfer or Pop or Quora that kind of do this research for you. There are a lot of issues with them as well, but like they will take your top competitors and look up exactly how many times each one of those phrases is used and give you a recommendation. It's going to, going to be more accurate than a recommendation like uh, Yoast that's just saying, in general, to all websites, use your keyword five times, but um, it's not perfect. So just keep in mind with almost all SEO tools, they require knowledge to be able to figure out when to disregard and when to actually take their advice. Perfect. All right, I'm gonna read you the next question, let you awesome. start with that. Uh, this is a good one. <laughs> is it a good or bad idea to name my business city name photography? So for you, yeah. let's say your business was literally Portland photography or Portland wedding photographer. Yeah, totally. So it, in general for SEO, this can be a tactic that works. Um, branding yourself might be a little bit more difficult. Uh, I think whenever somebody hears a term like, would you buy a car dealership from Portland car dealer? Like, um, I don't know, like it, it, it makes you seem somewhat generic, but if we're just looking at SEO, it does open a few possibilities. Um, first, every time that term is mentioned online, Google kind of has to figure out if they're mentioning your business name or not, which could possibly think or make Google think that you're being uh, talked about more online than other photographers or that there are more citations to, about your business online than other photographers. Likewise, when you do actually go build citations uh, in directories like Yellow Pages and Yext and all of those, those th sites, you're repeating that main keyword that you're targeting for your, your website across all of those, which is great. They're, they're not usually linked, but they're, you're, you're showing up for that term related to your site or to your, to your entity. And then what gets really interesting for SEO is that it unlocks the ability to use that 
phrase as your anchor text across all of the links that you're building to your site very naturally because it is very like it's probably most typical for people's backlinks to have the anchor text for their business name uh, and so if you had a disproportionate number of links that say portland photography it's going to improve those rankings and google's not going to be able to really penalize you because that is your business name um, i wonder if the algorithm is refined enough to understand the difference i would think it should but i don't know <laughs> i think that's one case where in some cases it probably is but in general i i mean we, we've just, we've seen this work almost too well um there we there's one city where we have a client that the number one ranking photographer is a site that we thought was a spam site at first because it's just that city wedding photography. They have a decent backlink profile, nothing crazy, but they are solidly in the first place position with that brand and with that exact match uh, domain. Um, yep. And they don't really deserve to be probably like they're not the most authoritative photography company in that in that city by far. And the site is terrible. The site, like we said, we thought it was spam. We, it's that bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, what about the challenge of uh, Google My Business? And let's say that, you know, on average, I would say probably 30 to 50 percent of organic clicks to a photography website are some form of branded search yeah um, that's just like people who aren't doing like amazing with seo and have tons of articles that are driving traffic but for like sure. on average for the sites i look at it's probably around 30 percent of all of their traffic from search is branded yeah so if your branded search is portland photography and someone does that search they're they're probably not very likely to get a knowledge graph panel for that sometimes they may yeah uh, but what do you think what are the odds and could that be a bad thing you're right i think that is one of the that is one of the drawbacks, is that you're not going to see a knowledge graph. So it's going to lower the click-through rate for your actual branded terms. Uh, so, so that is an issue. Um, but personally, like we've seen how well Google My Business like spam in the title of a business works. Like If you add your, your target keyword to your Google My Business listings uh, company name, it's going to rank better, typically going to rank in the top 10. Like it just works. And so if your business is actually named Portland Wedding Photography, uh, I mean, I think currently in Portland, there's a business that has that set as their name and they're ranking in, in the top 10 results when I check. So in the um, map pack, you're saying in the map pack. So like you're going to see an increase in map pack. Probably you're going to see an increase in like organic top 10 desktop, like web results you are probably going to see a decrease in branded, but if those people are actually looking for you, they're probably going to try harder than the typical person to make sure they find your website. So I think overall, all things considered, it's probably a net gain. You just have to really be able to commit to that branding because it's not like, you're just going to sound generic and kind of spammy if you're calling yourself Los Angeles wedding photography or something. Yeah, it does. It is a little weird. I've seen cases where I think it could be really smart, uh, yeah. especially I've seen some boudoir and newborn terms where I was like, you could totally just name your business that yeah. and dominate the ranking like almost immediately. Yep. Cause people were thinking about like adding a separate piece of their business for boudoir or something. I'm like, well, why don't you just name it Portland boudoir photographer or something like that. Yeah. And, if they did, that doesn't seem quite as, uh, maybe it's just a spammy, I don't know. Yeah. That's up to your own personal taste. But yeah. realize, one more thought on this. I've seen a few people run into trademark issues with this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. If you are using a name that, let's say it's Portland Wedding Photographer, but someone else is Portland Wedding Photography, maybe you just didn't see them, whatever, but they've had it for 20 years and they have a trademark on it, you could get in trouble with trademark there. Um, you may not be able to trademark certain terms like this that include a city name. It's a little weird, the laws on that. So uh, if you're concerned about trademark, then that's another thing to consider here. It, it can be a little muddy. Definitely agree. All right. I think we're ready for the next question. Yeah, go for it. Let's do um, what you need to do on a daily or weekly basis to keep slash improve your Google ranking. Man, that's a good one. Yeah. Daily or weekly basis. Hmm. So I would say 
if you've done all of the right things in the beginning to maintain your rankings you don't necessarily need to do anything daily maybe not even weekly it kind of depends on the market it depends on the keywords the competition um for example i have an article that is about uh, so it's a review of some tools and it ranks very well number one position for the main tar keywords i'm targeting but there's several other it's an affiliate term so like there's money to be made with it and there are several other people who are like really gunning for it and they're constantly trying to tweak to try to get to number one knock me out and so in those cases i probably need to be monitoring the ranking the position and seeing if someone does knock me out or they gain a featured snippet that i didn't gain or something along those lines i need to see is it because they improved their title is it because it's more it's getting a better click-through rate and google's serving it more um you know, things like that just like being really aware of little fluctuations in the top rankings it can be time consuming and for me personally it's something that i only do occasionally definitely once a year in the beginning of the year i'm going to go and look at things that said 2019 that are still relevant for 2020 and update the date um <clears throat> you know other minor changes there's there's like a hundred changes on some of my sites that i've been meaning to do and just haven't done um but i would say it's a lot of monitoring and seeing how things are doing it's a little bit hard because when you get to different spots there are different actions that you would potentially take so let's say you weren't ranking at all you did some seo work and now you're on page three right now your, th your thing you want to do is probably wait a little bit longer but let's say you wait six months and you're still on page three you just can't get past that well in this case i'm probably going to focus on some more on page changes to see if i can bump it on up to page two maybe page one but let's say a different scenario i was ranking page five or six i do some on page make it excellent and i get to the the top of page two i'm position 12 or something like that well now i would say it gets into the point where i'm going to really want to think about building backlinks uh that's at least a possibility something i might need to do so as a daily or weekly activity for seo the first things that come to my mind are typically build backlinks get reviews um make new content like yeah, totally. <laughs> other than monitoring and tweaking it's those things and so as far as like how to get backlinks that's a long conversation we could have on another episode but you know just thinking through what can i do today to get someone to see my content to link to my content um what kind of new content can i create today or how can i get reviews from the clients that i'm working with today yeah i'll, I'll throw it in a super quick answer but uh daily every morning when i wake up and i have coffee uh, i pull up a rank tracking tool and i look at all of the projects that i'm working on and i know that there are massive issues with all rank trackers and i don't look at this data as like an overall like like i don't trust these numbers but they have shown me when there are trends and so i i i look at an overview of like for my own domain i typically put the main one or two target terms for each piece of content that i write uh, and I just look and see like what what pages are moving up or down. If I see a big swing or if I see something that's interesting, I, it just tells me to like look further. Um, and then after I'm done looking at those for all of the projects I'm working on, I look at Google Search Console and I look at the overall trend of the domain. Um, and then I my, my favorite quick metric is to look at uh, 28 days versus the previous 28 days, which pages and which queries are gaining or losing clicks. I also That's like to look, at, yeah, look at that on a weekly basis. So, uh, current seven days versus previous seven days, like that week, which pages are up or down? Uh, that's going to tell you the real numbers that those rank tracking tools aren't really able to show. Um, and if I see that something has lost a bunch of impressions and clicks, then I know that either somebody took me out of a position that was had a high click-through rate, or maybe Google will realize like this is not the right content for this query or something and I, I need to really dive in. Um, outside of that, like Corey said, building links is like I think the number one thing that I think about outside of creating content. I think that both of us 
we spend some time like thinking about link building, but most of the time we're just like, there's so many content opportunities and, and topics that we can write about and create content for that would bring traffic without links or with very few links um, that we, we haven't, we have endless notebooks full of ideas. We just need to get written, formatted and published. So, yeah, exactly. So yeah, in our case with our sites, especially we're thinking about the feel your photos site, um, <clears throat> a few other random projects that we have that are very content driven it makes more sense to spend more time on creating better content and more content than it does to pursue link building at this point. Uh, but if you are a small local service business and like I said, you get, you find yourself in that situation where you just can't budge from position 12, creating more content might not help if you're, if you're really after a single ranking for a single keyword and you're in position 12, like more content is not necessarily going to help you rank better for that keyword, whereas links might. So prioritizing that, depending on your situation, um, is certainly something to think about. Let's go to the next question. Cool. Okay, so this is an interesting one. Uh, I'm interested to see how you take this or yeah. which direction you take this. How can I correct all of the things I have been doing wrong with SEO? Yeah, so... First thing um, is prioritization. So this can take some knowledge or experience to really uh, get right. But one problem with SEO is that it's very easy to create extremely long lists of all of the issues that are wrong with your site. Uh, people like SEOs can do that all day. Auditing tools will tell you that you have 15,000 errors that you need to fix on your site. Um, you'll get the emails in your inbox from spam SEO people that are like, we, we found 3,000 issues and then we, we can fix these and you have a number one ranking. Not true. Um, and if it is wrong, yeah, just wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you do have a lot of issues, you still need to prioritize which ones are going to give you the, the greatest benefit for the least amount of work. Or sometimes you just have massive issues that have to be fixed because they are completely ruining any ranking potential your site has. Um, in general, those are going to be like actual like server issues, technical issues that like maybe your site is completely de-indexed, um, things like that, like fix first. After that, like a bare minimum of like somewhat fasting loading website, I think is kind of necessary these days. Like you, you probably should have it loading faster than five seconds to see some success on SEO, like something like that. Um, but it really becomes site structure overall. And then content pruning is probably like where we see the biggest improvements from sites that have been around a while, uh, making sure that you only have the, like content that's performing well in Google indexed in Google. Um, and so for, for most of the sites we look at when we do an audit or they come to us and ask questions, they might have 5,000 pages indexed. Out of the 5,000, they're seeing actual traffic from 40. They should have closer to 40 pages indexed um, <laughs> and not the 4,000. So like fixing those uh, oversized images, compressing images um, is huge. Um, outside of that, it's it's pretty much like you're going to see the most, uh, with most photographers, you're going to see the, the greatest benefit from just creating better content. Yeah, I think I agree with you on that. I like what you said about prioritizing what's going to actually move the needle. I, I think if it were me and I were like, okay, I've been doing SEO wrong for 10 years. I'm starting to learn how to do it right now. What, what should, how can I fix what I've done wrong? Yeah. I would start with kind of a self audit. I would probably look in search console and I would see what are my current top performing pages. Let's, you're probably going to find that it's five or six pages that are driving 80% of the traffic to your site. It could be as many as 20 or something like that, but it's not going to be a lot of pages that are driving most of your traffic. I would go to those pages and I would try to focus on fixing the problems with those pages so that they could perform even better if that's a possibility. Um, and then, you know, obviously pages like your homepage, that's probably going to be on that list. Yeah. Um, you know, fixing some of the issues there you know, if, if you know you have issues with things like you've got some spammy things going on with 
Google My Business or other citations or like weird backlinks or stuff like that. You might need to be taking some steps to like backpedal, disavow some yeah. things, clean up some things like that. Most people probably aren't going to find themselves in that situation unless they were just like taking really bad SEO advice and you know whatever. But I think for the most people, it's going to be it's going to be first find the pages that are most valuable to you and clean those up think about what other pages you can create that are similar to those pages. And then third, what Dylan was talking about last there, cleaning up the dead weight. And most often you probably need to do a big call. Just I've, I've seen 40%, 60% just deleted all in one go and not hurt traffic whatsoever. Yeah. On my site, I just recently, my, my photography website, that's kind of become an experiment website recently just did a big experiment with this. And this could probably be a, a whole podcast episode. Yeah. Um, but I deleted, I think I had around 115 total pages and I deleted around 90 of them wow. deleted. No That's three, awesome. one redirects, yeah. nothing, just gone, just straight up gone. My traffic has only gone up since then. So that's awesome. It's not a direct correlation of like deleting this made my traffic go up. I, I wrote one new piece of content that's been bringing in a lot of new traffic. Uh, but the deleting has definitely not hurt any of the rankings of the pages <laughs> that were actually ranking the ones that I kept. Uh, so understand that sometimes old bad habits can be dead weight that do hold you back and you need to cut them off. Um, and of course we have a whole flow chart on how to do this and like exactly what to do and when to do it, yeah. whether you should delete no index or redirect. Um, and it takes you through or re-optimize for something else. Like we have a whole chart of how to do all of that. So it's a little bit complicated to explain every scenario but we did our best with that flowchart in the course all right uh, this question's for you Corey. Um, <laughs> how to improve seo in multiple languages why do you give me that one that one should be for you i was thinking the same <laughs> but it's okay <laughs> um i say that because dylan has actually worked on sites that are multilingual like big sites uh that have millions of pages in another language. I, mean, um, I can take it if you want, but it's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, let me give my first initial thought on it and then you take it from there. Cool. My initial thought is <laughs> probably, okay, so again, thinking from the perspective of a photographer, probably you don't need to. Like yep. in most, in like 95% of cases, you don't necessarily need everything translated um you need to pick a primary market and you need to understand who's searching for you and what language they're using to search and you need to really hone in on that yeah. i'm sure there are edge cases especially when you get into europe where you have countries that you're like on the border and you could easily get people from from either side that may speak a different language those cases are tricky for sure but like in general my thought is why are you trying to optimize for multiple languages? Do you really truly have two completely separate markets that are going to equally be searching for your services in their own language? Yeah. What do you think? I mean, I was thinking about this exact, I, we've had quite a few of these questions pop up in the last few weeks. I started doing a blog post on this topic and I was thinking about this yesterday that you're right. I don't think most of those people actually need to invest the time and the technical like resources that are required to do this properly um, not for photographers like this this isn't a, an e-commerce site that needs to be able to sell worldwide these are people that like you're saying if they really look at their business they have a primary market and that includes the, the main language that those people speak um, I have had maybe two clients in my career that didn't speak English I don't need to cater my website to their needs, they were able to find me and book me. Um, it would be just kind of absurd for me to like translate my site, uh, do the hreflang tags that are necessary, um, make sure that the copy is actually saying the right things and putting off like and giving them like the right uh, messaging into those different languages. Um, Obviously, you're right. If, if I was in Europe and it's like you're in Switzerland and you're like, do I do I do German? Do I do Swiss? Do I do French? Like, that becomes tricky. Um, and in those cases, there are decent translation plugins that, from what I can see, most of the time 
almost always do the hreflang implementation correct, but it's complex. Um, yeah, essentially the thing you're really wanting to think about here is, you remember earlier when I said that sometimes Google has to guess and we don't want them to guess. We always want to tell them exactly what we want them to do. And so hreflang, what Dylan just mentioned is just the way of telling them, hey, this is the one that's in this language and the, the alternate that's in another language is over here and vice versa on the other page to keep it extremely clear. Google doesn't have to guess, should I index this French page in the English Google or should I index this you know, English page in the French Google? Because they, they're going their indexes are going to be different across the different uh, engines. Now, they won't be 100% different. Google will index uh, sites with different language on like in English, you'll find sites that are indexed on from other languages. That's totally normal, but you know, you need you need to give Google the the right message to ex say exactly what you want them to do. That's the trickiest thing as far as technical, as far as strategy goes. Though yeah. it's like it's a mess. It's so muddy. It really is. Yeah, it's hard, and we've even seen with all of the technical done properly. Sometimes Google's like we're only gonna index the French version of your site and serve it to people worldwide. So that's great. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's it's a minefield. I I think in almost every case, it's not worth the effort. Um, and I would really try to persuade anybody looking into that to really, really, really think about their, their target market. Yeah. You wanna do two more questions? Sure, sounds good. All right. We'll experiment with length. Guys, let us know how long you want episodes like this to be. If we're just doing, Q and A, uh, how long do you want to listen to Q and A? Can you listen for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour? Uh, we're up for anything, but let us know what you think. All right, let's go to the next. And that is, um, let's skip that one for now. Let's go to, uh, here's a good one. Is this something I should learn or outsource? Cool, yeah, I mean, we, we just published a blog post on this uh, last week, I believe, Corey wrote it and yeah, we, after years of doing both uh, SEO services for photographers and teaching, uh, we, we've really been persuaded that the best results come from people that understand the basic frameworks of SEO, have a, a high level understanding of the technical and like structural uh, aspects of SEO. And at that point, they're able to choose if they're wanting to or able to invest in SEO. Um, you typically by just booking freelancers to do specific tasks. Um, we see time and time again, most of the people that book or end up buying like SEO packages, especially from larger companies or even some like smaller freelancy SEO companies just people getting burned. Um, those packages often guarantee a lot and they might be at a fairly low price point and they can have, they, it can range from wrecking your site with spam links and bad technical implementation to just not doing anything and being a total complete waste of money. So it's, yeah, we, we really think that people need to be educated first. Yeah, I, yeah, I think exactly. It's it, the question, the way it's phrased is basically, should I learn this or outsource? Well, I would say you have to learn this to outsource, yeah. um, and then you can decide whether you want to outsource. I would say, for us, it makes sense to outsource certain tasks uh, once we have a high level of understanding of how things work and what we want. So, for example, we're talking right now about hiring some people to do some writing for us. And the idea is we've got a perfect system for outlining and researching a post. We could do that part and then hand it off to someone to fill in. Um, that would take, let's say it takes typically six hours to write a post um, and a couple hours to outline it. You know, we could be saving that six hours by handing it off to someone who could do that part for us. But when we get it back, we're going to know whether it's right or wrong. Like is this what we were going for? Is this quality we're looking for? Because we understand what works. So if you don't understand what you're looking for, it's very hard to hire someone to help you. But once you do, once you understand the basics, how search engines work, 
uh, what factors make a difference and which ones don't, then you can speak with an expert or hire someone to do a very specific tasks for you. Perfect. Cool. Did you pick a good last question? Gosh, I mean, this this is a fun one, but is WordPress the only way to go for <laughs> SEO? <laughs> Did you want to make this an extra 30 minutes? <laughs> I know, right? Oh, man. So I am a big WordPress fan. I started using WordPress in like version two and or maybe one point something, I think. It was a long time ago. <clears throat> very very few photographers were using wordpress and at the time it was just like a blog as a home page so you know my article would be i think i had full text article and the next article and the next article like all full text on the home page like 10 articles and then you click to the next anyway point is i've been using wordpress for a long time i've kind of uh used it it's it's been a thing that i've learned the ins and outs of over the years I wouldn't say I'm like an expert WordPress developer, but I know how to get around, create custom um, <clears throat> codes and all that stuff. All that to say, I'm a little bit biased. So I love WordPress. I think in general, especially the more that I step back and look at the web as a whole and where the web is going and how the web is how the web works how people are using phones instead of computers and other devices that are coming along. Uh, I, I realize that WordPress is not a perfect solution. Um, it is one that it, it's not a clean and simple solution to a situation that often would do better with a clean and simple solution. Uh, in other words, it's too much engineering for a simple problem for a lot of people. They need a website that has like very simple few pages, a home page, an about page, a contact page, and then the ability to like add articles as a blog post type page. That should be relatively simple, but WordPress is a a bit overkill yeah. for that because it has to work for so many different applications. Now they've done a good job of keeping the core pretty simple and like that's the whole point of plugins is you add plugins to add that extra functionality you add themes that might have some extra features things like that um I'm, I'm saying all of that to kind of give two backgrounds like one i think wordpress is great i love it two i, I think wordpress is probably from a developer standpoint an ugly solution to something that could be more elegant in some cases um <clears throat> that being said <laughs> the alternate for for a photographer right now is going to be something like Squarespace, Show It, Wix, um, you know, some of these other like simple platforms, and they are so bad in so many ways. I, I'm not, I won't say they're all like completely bad. There are good things about Squarespace or Show It. I guess maybe there's something good about Wix. I'm not sure if I found it yet, but. <laughs> um, <laughs> There are good things about these platforms, but from an SEO perspective, I have found them to be a nightmare. And so there's just, when you start to get into the scenarios, like the ones that we face with clients who are having problems and come to us, typically that's whenever Squarespace and Show It are extremely limiting. If you never run into those kinds of issues, maybe they'll just work for you perfectly forever. There's probably a lot of people who are happy on the platforms because they're just working fine. But if you start to try to work on some sort of advanced strategy, just the other day in our um, our course community, we had someone who we, we had been talking about table of contents plugins and they went and added a table of contents to a whole bunch of posts in WordPress. Um, and over the course of a couple of weeks, saw a, a large increase in traffic across those pages. And I think they were getting more featured snippets and things like that. And that's the kind of thing where you just can't do it. You can't do it in Squarespace. Now in Show It, I guess technically, if you're on like the highest tier and you can add plugins, you could still do that theoretically if you can get it to work. Sometimes there's problems with dropping short codes in because of the way that the, the, the Show It side handles the WordPress. So maybe, maybe it could work on Show It. But the, that's just a one example of like, if you're working on anything advanced or if you're working on new and emerging technologies, 
amp yeah. is a huge one that we're thinking about like so hard now right now to be fair it's probably easier to use amp on your posts in squarespace than it is on wordpress because you can sure. just like turn it on now it's going to be ugly as heck but um but it works. you could turn it on and it could get you better rankings like yeah. almost immediately whereas in wordpress it's going to be a bit of a pain yeah but yeah thinking about amp thinking about getting featured snippets and the way that the the serps are shifting and just being able to adapt to that quickly with the format of your content it's so hard on a closed platform whereas on wordpress someone's working on a solution for all of these things all the time there are plugins out there you can have someone a, a developer easily customize things for you yeah. i just can't imagine using anything other than wordpress for like the average photographer right now i mean um, like most of these platforms are multiple years behind on many like web standards like uh webp um when is squarespace going to support that i never i don't know like um amp was a great example lazy loading like native lazy loading that now works in chrome firefox edge like it's going to be in the html standard is that ever going to come to squarespace probably not like um i mean eventually but like that was working when WordPress, like, or like, as soon as it's like a beta feature in some browser, there's a WordPress plugin. Like, yeah. um, and th those are just quick examples to say that, like, or like, Short Pixel is one of our favorite WordPress plugins that automatically compresses and resizes your images. If you use that and then put them into Squarespace, Squarespace recompresses at a higher file size and upreses your photos to 2,500 pixels wide. Like, <laughs> It just those things are so frustrating on other platforms. Um, WordPress isn't perfect. It can, it's getting better. I mean, I, I was thinking about the ultimate category, my my personal cycling blog website that I just built on WordPress, and I use the standard theme that comes with all WordPress installations. Now I'm using the Gutenberg Builder, that is in all WordPress. That process was not terrible. Like I I, I feel like if people only know WordPress from five or six plus years ago they need to give it a second look uh, because... yeah or they're using some really bad themes something yeah. they downloaded on theme forest that <laughs> yeah. you know again was trying to cater to way too many people or some terrible page builder <laughs> yeah you know even some of the good ish page builders like yeah. like divi Profoto, flow themes even and their their new builder and their flex builder like all of these are they're they're good they're innovative solutions they're interesting solutions but they can also break a lot of things yeah. <laughs> and bulk up a lot of things that don't need to be bulky. It goes back to that whole like things being over-engineered so that they can apply to multiple situations. Whereas like a perfect solution would, Dylan, you want to talk about uh, something like Gatsby <laughs> or something? Yeah, I mean, perfect end solution like to get rid of all of these would be, there's a, a JavaScript framework called Gatsby. It's Pretty, it's based on React components, but they put performance first. It's uh, serverless. Um, it's just pretty much like everything works. Like AMP is a little bit of a problem. Like we're we're looking at how to do this with AMP. Uh, it can accept any data source, so you can use WordPress in the back end, but they're not using WordPress to actually show your pages to users. Um, it's easy to host these on CDNs so that all around the world people are getting the fastest like they're getting static html pages directly from the closest possible server they're super fast performance uh, they do a lot of like, that that part right there yeah. that's the key is that wordpress introduces a database into places that don't sites don't technically need the no. database wordpress sites like no. that's why you know something like gatsby can work with markdown files even on blog posts it because really all you're doing is saving photos and text and like you don't necessarily need the database to be able to do that uh, this kind of stuff i don't know i'm sure. i'm kind of on the fence on how i feel about that for like this the typical site especially like a blog site yeah. i i think it's probably a better solution a simpler solution that would work i'm still happy with wordpress for now yeah. especially when you use wordpress like it's intended to be used so if you're we I at least am a WordPress purist basically where I believe that WordPress core should be used you know it's like the engine of your site and then you add plugins to add functionality you add theme to add styling 
and you can build in those areas but you don't like introduce all of this random crap that most themes and plugins are doing like ugh, it just yeah. starts to get such be such a mess and, and i think with gutenberg it's becoming more and more possible especially right now if you know some css you can probably make gutenberg do almost anything totally exactly and if you don't so. know css a web designer that does is going to be quite cheap like yeah. everyone who does web design knows css so it's easy to find someone to help yeah anyway cool. we talked about that for too long probably for a q a episode we, yeah. we should do a whole episode on wordpress sometime i think <laughs> totally wordpress versus squarespace or show it or something nice cool well why don't we wrap this up here uh, and guess we really want your feedback so let us know what you thought of this q a format did you like it is it interesting to listen to us talk about these things um we're going to try a different format as well but we want to see how this would go with this kind of q a we have hundreds of questions that people have submitted and we could always take more from the audience i don't know how long we'll be able to do this before they get like really repetitive yeah. but i mean there's a lot of different questions so for sure that's if you like it and we'll do it again any other final thoughts still that's pretty much it thanks everybody all right see you next time <laughs>